Hello, this is Jeff Gariosi, and you're on MisplacedStraws.com, where music comes to life. And there was a time where there was nothing better than walking into a record store and discovering a band you had never heard before, but you bought the record simply because it had an amazing cover. And along with my guests today, we're going to be starting a reoccurring series that talks about some of those amazing covers. He's one of the most legendary cover artists of the last five decades, and he's pretty much the only one that's worked across multiple genres and with multiple bands. Today, we're going to give a sampling of some of those genres and bands, and on later episodes, we'll concentrate on some specific ones, as well as his incredible stories inside the cover. Please welcome Giannis. Welcome back, my friend. How are you doing? Hey, you got me blushing, man. That was a great <laughs> How are you? Good, good. Now, before we get into some actual covers, let's talk a little bit about your background for everybody. Um, how did you get into doing covers, and what was your first big one? Jeez, uh, I, 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 it's, you know, I, I drew as far back as I can remember. Um, I was always uh, fascinated with comic books and animation and uh that kind of art I gravitated to uh, in Europe uh, around 1972, 73. I was a, still a kid. Um, I bought my first two album with my own money. I remember that year specifically. I bought um, Uriah Heap, Demons and Wizards, mm -hmm. and Deep Purple Machine Head. And that was it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I looked at that and I, you know, I became, you know, of course, I, you know, I gravitated from, uh, you know, the Osmonds and the Partridge family. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> As we all did, yeah. <laughs> into rock and roll. Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. um, and I, and, uh, you know, but then I was reading, you know, comic books, you know, Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. it, it, all, it, all, it all made sense, mm -hmm. you know, rock and roll and fantasy art, and it all clicked in. But I remember specifically, and I told the story to make box of your right heap, I remember, I was so mesmerized with the record cover artwork, Demons mm. and Wizards. So I was sitting there staring at it. You know, I was like, oh, God, this is so great. So, you know, a few years later, now we were in the United States, my family. And uh, I, uh, you know, more and more I became obsessed with music and rock. I wasn't, didn't know if I was going to, you know, join a band or mm. but my art th the talents were stronger than my musical talents. <laughs> um, and um, it would just, it, it just started, it, actually my first commission was the club that was playing, I was working in my uncle's restaurant and the club next to me, it was a rock club. And I remember that evening, I was 16, 17, mm -hmm. and uh, the guy ran out of ice and he came over to borrow some ice, you know, to, to fill, he say he filled me out and we're talking, I'm like, hey, Bobby, how you doing? You know, we're talking and he says, hey, you know, your uncle told me you're a really good artist. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I draw, you know, I was, you know whatever. He said, hey, you want to do a, 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 a poster for me for one of the bands that's playing, you know, local bands, right? Yeah. And I said, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. He goes, look, uh, you know, I'll pay you for it. If I like it, it'll be great, you know? So I was like, okay, I was doing terrific. And it was uh, the Michael Bolton band, which turned into <laughs> Michael Bolton, band, which turned into Michael Bolton eventually. So I've known Michael since 1977. But, um, I remember doing the artwork and, uh, you know, he was just, you know, he, he got the next day, you know, because, you know, they make the, the posters mm -hmm. and they print them all over the city, you know, mm -hmm. uh, New Haven, uh, where Yale University is, thriving club scene. So he said, wow, this is great. He gave me like 50 bucks, you know, mm -hmm. and I thought it was like all the money in the world. I thought it was mm -hmm. the greatest thing I ever got. And he goes, hey, you want to do some more? I'm like, yeah, uh, sure. So by the end of that summer, man, I was like, Ever knew what this Greek kid who did rock and roll art for all the bands, and that's how it started, and it gravitated from that. And then I went to college, mm -hmm. and I studied graphic design and art, and I was notorious for cutting classes and not showing up mm -hmm. because I would grab my portfolio and I'd be taking trips to New York, and anybody I can get like to stop on the street and look at my work, I would be showing it <laughs> to them. So. By 1983, I did my first record cover for this band uh, called uh, Art in America, and their manager uh, was the attorney for Steven Tyler and for Aerosmith. 
And he brought me to the management company, which was Lieber and Krebs, and said, hey, this kid's really great. You should use him. And I started doing all kinds of odd stuff and mm-hmm. designs. One of my first clients was Paul O'Neill. He took a really liking to me. We worked together, and you know, you know who Paul is. Sabotage and Trans Siberian yeah. Orchestra. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I just I miss Paul dearly. You know, great he's man. The way. Yeah. Um, I remember Paul telling us about this. You know, when we were working together, he says, "I got this idea. I'm going to do this band. It's going to have, mm. you know, mm. it's going to be like Kiss, but but it's going to be like Pink Floyd meets Cats." And we would make merciless fun of him, going, this is the stupidest idea you have yet to come up with. Uh, you know, he had the last laugh on us because that, that turned into the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, yeah. which was sabotage that morphed into right. that, right? Um, but yeah, it started like that. So by the 80s, it took off. And it, you know, I just started getting more commissions, more bands. And I gravitated from being an artist to being an art director. And then we started doing all kinds of things. And um, the last... the 25 years, for 25 years we ran my own agency and we did everything. We did movie posters, all entertainment industry, yeah. radio station logos, uh, movie posters, independent film channel. I work with stars, I work with HBO, I work with, you know, uh, XM radio, uh, you name it. But it's always been music. It's always, yeah. uh, that's my biggest love mm. and my biggest drive. And- Let's get into some of it. I, we have a couple covers that just sort of show all the different genres that you work in. Um, so first up, the Hall of Fame band that pretty much everybody loves, uh, the Allman Brothers and their record, Where It All Begins. What well, can you tell us about that one? Um, okay. Uh, well, first of all, here's the, uh, the infamous piece, right? We're talking about. Mm. Actually, this just came out on, on vinyl. Mm. And, uh, there's the cover, and there's the back, and uh, and here's the uh, artwork for that. You know, that's cool. Um, yeah. How that started was, I got a friend of mine um, who was working with us. Um, he was working with a concert, with a concert promoter. Mm. Uh, told me that he, he said, "Listen, um, you know, you know, you know, I was like, yeah, who doesn't know the Olmer brothers?" He mm. goes, "You know, they regrouped, they're back together, they're." touring and they're going to be doing they'll be going on the horde tour i think it was called mm-hmm. and uh you know would you like to do some merchandise and design for them and i said yeah sure and uh so he set up a meeting with their manager who was in uh in massachusetts not far from where i am mm-hmm. you know where I, i'm in connecticut mm-hmm. and um so i got my ideas together and I was, we took the right up to meet with a manager. And uh, last minute, I thought, you know, I'm going to bring one of my paintings with me. I don't know why. I just wanted to show him what mm-hmm. my stuff looks like, right? you know, my finished pieces. So we went up there. We're meeting. And I'm talking to him. And, you know, I, I was, this is 1994. And I've had been doing it now for 10 years, uh, you know, uh, professionally. Mm-hmm. And I could tell when a client is engaged or when you know, I'm losing him, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, you know, he kept looking over my shoulders and explaining my ideas. I'm thinking to myself, okay, we're going nowhere here. This, he's not going to go for this. And at one point he just stopped me and he said, forget all this. I said, you yeah, know, I thought to myself, oh, well, there, there goes that. He goes, I really need a record cover. I really like that. And he showed, you know, mm-hmm. looked at my painting and said, oh yeah. He goes, what can you do with this? And he goes back and he gives me this, this drawing, rough drawing. And I said, what's this? And he said, Dickie drew that. And it's a mushroom with a bunch of naked girls <laughs> running around it. And I said, well, I get the mushroom. I said, you know, that's you guys. But mm. I don't know about the naked girls. You know, I, this is going to work. He goes, well, I don't know. Take the mushroom to the next level, man. <laughs> Just do that. You know, that was my brief, right? <laughs> so what's the title of the album? We don't know yet. We don't have a title. What, what you know? Some, well, I know you guys are not gonna sound like hip hop. You know, what's the music like? <laughs> Can type. You know, it's like, uh, where are they now? I said, can I talk to them? Because no, they're recording in Jupiter, Florida, so there's no time. Mm-hmm. Just, just do your thing. Just, just, just run mm-hmm. with it. I'm like, okay. Um, so I drive back to my house, and um, I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, you know. If I do comps, 
these guys are just not going to get this. Mm -hmm. Usually you show pencil comp ideas. So I did this mini painting about this big, mm -hmm. little tiny painting like, yeah. with the whole my concept. So I figured, you know, I did it. Then I put like an acetate over it. I stuck the logo. So it just kind of mucked up a fake cover, you know, mm -hmm. but it was just a little reproduction. So um, I called him up and said, hey, Bert, try it. It's Bert Holman. It's a match. He said, yeah. He goes, I said, yeah, you want to see it? He goes, yeah, come on up. So I go running up there. I bring him the artwork. He looks at it. He's like, wow, this is great. I love this. He goes, okay, okay, okay. He goes, listen, I'm going to show this to Dickie. Dickie was sort of the spokesman for the band at the yeah. time. He goes, and the rest of them. And uh, I'll get back to you. But I, I, I think this is going to work. So... Um, so I drive back, a couple of days go by, I'm a little nervous. All of a sudden, you know, the phone call comes in. Mm -hmm. First, Johannes, this is fantastic. They love it. Ready to go. Okay, so when can you have the layouts ready to epic? Tomorrow? Day after? Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, but mm -hmm. I got to paint the cover. <laughs> he goes, what do you mean you have to paint the cover? You know, the record cover. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that the cover you gave me? That was like a five by five inch sketch. Don't take I said, no, now I got to paint it. He goes, I thought that was the record cover. I said, no, man. That was like, he goes, oh, geez, I got to call them. I got to go through this all over again. I said, he goes, all right, well, listen, just do it. And when is it going to be ready? How quick can you have this? I said, ah, this was like a Monday, I think, or Tuesday. So I said, ah, he goes, Friday. They're up here. We're rehearsing for the tour. Mm. Get it done and get it up here. Mm. And then we'll, we'll go from there. So I had some like four days to paint it. <laughs> so I did the original. I mean, it's, yeah. it's big. So I, pack, I finished it, packed it in my car. You know, we go driving up there to, uh, to Massachusetts. They're in, in a warehouse. And they yeah. have set up. So, you know, I walk in. And there they are. And they're recording. I'm in awe. No, there's Greg mm. Holman. Warren Haynes, mm. Mickey Betts. That was the original lineup, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so they're, you know, they, they, they jam through a tune, and I'm just sitting there, I'm just soaking it all in, man. You know, it was, you're sitting two feet away from Greg Oldman. Yeah. This thing, you know? So, so Bert comes to me, he goes, okay, here's how we're going to do this. He goes, you're going to go in the other room, you're going to set up the artwork, I want you to sit there. Don't move, don't say a word. I'm going to bring one of them in at a time, okay? Mm. Because none of them, you know, they always argue with each other. Mm. So I don't want to have one, you know, mm. dislike or whatever the other. And each one of them will approve it. And then I'll leave them out. And then we'll get it done. I'm like, all right. So I go and I'm sitting there, Bert's sitting next to me, you know. So mm. you know, when comes Greg, you know, Greg, what do you think? I said, yeah, I uh, kind of like it. Yeah, it's, it's, I dig, I dig the scene, you know, whatever. And, you know, and they lined up J-Mo, mm. Butch Trucks. Uh, Butch is the one um, that I was the biggest fan of friends mm. with eventually that I became friends with. I did my work with him. Mm. He was my conduit to the band, yeah. and, uh, which I miss him, miss him dearly mm. um, after, you know, the tragic way things mm. ended with him. But um, the last one was Dickie. Remember, it was Dickie's idea yeah. now, you know? So just bringing him in. By the way, as the, you know, the last one's come in, Bert, you know, kind of leans over to me in my ear. It's like, listen, uh, I'm not going to say anything, but, and this is great. I really love this. But this looks nothing like the concept that you showed me originally. <laughs> and what had happened is because I left the comp there for him to show, yeah. I had to do it by memory, nothing matched. The <laughs> colors were different, the mushroom was different, everything. <laughs> It was different, right? <laughs> that, was the, that was like the joke, man. Mm. Like, you know, it was just a completely yeah. different illustration. Mm. So Dickie walks in, he looks at it, he goes, yeah, this to me says where it all begins. And that's the first time I heard the title. There you now, go. And it clicked, <laughs> right? You know, it was like, whoa. He goes, come here. He never got my name right ever. Come yeah. here, Giannis. <laughs> it's like he's his big freaking bear hug. That was great. Um, we finished the layouts. We did it. A couple of uh, weeks later, I'm up in Poughkeepsie, New York. It was their opening night. I'm backstage where they got to see all the layouts mm -hmm. and everything signed off on it. And uh, 
just sitting there up on the amplifiers up on stage, you know, by the side mm -hmm. with the amps and just behind the amplifiers and I'm sitting there. I'm just, uh, I just kind of let the moment soak in, man. I'm just watching the audience go nuts and they just kicked into it. They invited me. I went up to Woodstock too. So mm -hmm. I was there and hanging out and watching them play. And it, it, that's when it, when it hit me, when it sunk in, yeah. who I had just done work mm -hmm. for to watch all the people at Woodstock took bananas when they hit the stage. It's amazing. And my, by that time, yeah. they had my artwork yeah. behind them and stuff. And it was mm -hmm. just, it was, it was cool. It was an experience. And cool. yeah, moving on to our next one, again, showing a completely different type of genre. It's one of my favorite records of all time. And I know a band that's close to your heart as well. But go more into the prog rock, prog metal world with the amazing Fate's Warning and their record, A Pleasant Shade of Grey. Want to give us a little bit of the story behind that one? Um, I had done, uh, when I first met Fate's Warning it was in 1985. Mm -hmm. When I showed up at uh, my parents' home at the time, I was still going to school <laughs> and working. And, you know, they showed up very liberal with you know, barefooted with shorts and everything, summertime, middle of mm. summer, and everything, and they were all so animated and mm -hmm. you know, excited. And it was like, I, you know, and they're, they're talking to me, and they're like, yeah, I, I remember John Arch and Matthias stood out immediately because they, they had sparks flying. Yeah. And uh, I was doing a band called Heaven for Paul O'Neill, actually, mm -hmm. I was managing them. And uh, they told me, oh, you know, we got signed to this label called Metal Blade. And I had never heard of Metal Blade, you know, they were just starting. You know, we got our own record out. And like, uh, you know, can you do a, you know, we heard about you and, you know, you're, you're this guy. And, you know, can you do artwork for us? And I was like, yeah. So the first one that I did for them was Spectre Within. Mm -hmm. And then I did Awaken the Guardian. Mm -hmm. Then um, by that time, I, by 1987, now I had become an art trader. I was doing other stuff. You know, the band changed, the lineups, yeah. they moved on. And I did Dream Theater, mm -hmm. first album. And mm -hmm. uh, I, the, the Dream Theater are big fans of Fate's Warning. You know, they, yeah. they both hang out yeah, together. Very close. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're very close. And um, so I was at a Dream Theater show, and, you know, there's Jim. And I hadn't seen him, you know, we hadn't talked, I hadn't seen him in at least four or five years. He's like, hey man, what the hell are you doing? It was like, you know, we started to talk. And he said, oh, I've seen some of your stuff, what you've been doing lately. He goes, wow, you don't do just airbrush anymore. You know, because, you know, painting. He's like, oh, I saw some of your designs or anything. And he goes, hey, he goes, um, you know, we're doing a new album. You know, with, you know, I hadn't met Ray yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, yeah, well, they, you know, I said, you know, I, I mean, I kept tabs on him, but, you know. He goes, when well, I come up to the studio and hear it, see what you think. I'm like, yeah. I said, I'd love to. You know, it's the experience. So they were um, recording uh, at the Carriage House, I think, here in the yeah. Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went up there and um, I know he wanted me. He wanted to know if I would be interested in doing something. And he said, well, you know, it, it, it can be like the art cannot look like the other mm -hmm. base warning because we're different type of band now. I said, no, no, I get it. I said, no, you're more, you've gone progressive, you know, mm -hmm. rock more of yeah. it. But um, I remember it was actually, it was a late winter. It was just a cold kind of rainy day. And it was late mm -hmm. at night after I shut up the office, I ran up there and I was sitting in, I remember sitting in and uh, Jim was doing a guitar part. And I try to remember which part it was but it was, it was a piece of music he was playing and all I could think of was uh, slow motion, you know, drops of water falling. Mm -hmm. Like when you're looking at a puddle when it's raining and each time a drop of water falls, a puddle just is created, a ripple yeah. in slow motion in my head. And when I heard that music, I just, just kind of saw it like as a blue mm -hmm. image. And right there, that's like, that was the idea for the cover. And uh, Jim goes, well, so what are you thinking of this? And I said, you know, it's a very melancholic type of yeah. grayish, you know, kind of a thing. He goes, yeah, and he told me the title. And he goes, what do you, you know, what does it make you think of? And I said, just, just a rainy day, just images, mm -hmm. just a, on a, on a rainy day and everything he goes okay 
yeah, I like what your head's at. He goes, all right, you want to come back and show me some stuff? And I said, yeah. Um, previous weekends ago, I, I like to go out. Sometimes we go on the weekend, go drives. And um, mm. my wife, uh, sometimes we go to flea markets. And we went to this old bookstore. It was like sort of flea market bookstore, yeah. lots and ends. And this guy sold me a series of uh, postcards, pictures from 1904 or five. And there were images of his grandfather in China. Oh, wow. uh, it just, just this wealth. And mm. it just looked like images from another planet because just, you know, what that world was like. They were very voyeuristic, very personal. Right photographs picture of him sitting in a hallway in front of structures or whatever mm. and it was that plus photographs i had shot in in new orleans of the mm. landscape in new orleans you know down at the uh, french quarter mm. of life stills and a it was a combination of those two things that created the artwork as a matter of fact, out of that session, I also pulled the same artwork. And if you kind of compare it, they're very similar for the band of Flower Kings, the cover I did for Rainmaker. Mm -hmm. If you look at that, yeah. look at that imagery yeah. and you look at the one yeah. in face warning of a perfect shade of gray, mm -hmm. it looks like it's the same thing, except the Flower Kings are color yeah. and the face warning mm -hmm. is a blue tinted mm -hmm. kind of thing. But they both have the same mood and feel to mm -hmm. them. And I was done. And uh, that was the cover. What was so great about this project, though, is that there were a lot of things that I wanted to do that I didn't have a chance to because of the budget and the time restrictions. Mm -hmm. So when we did the anniversary edition, I was able to really do what I wanted to do, and I was able to um, include imagery that I didn't have time to do. So right. here's the front cover, and the way I envision it, it's almost like, and of course, there's the back cover. Mm. The way I envision it is they look like scenes from a movie that doesn't exist. Mm. And these are like, the music is the soundtrack to this film. So there's the images and, and there's one of the shots of that guy. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, that is such bizarre landscape. It, it looks very surreal, mm. very Pink Floydish. Oh, without a doubt. You know, um, that, the, um, the and, and that's one too, where the cover just so fits the mood of the songs and the records. It's just a perfect package, that whole yeah. album. They wanted an image like 2112 or, mm -hmm. no, of course, you know, they're Rush fans. Yeah. So that's yep. what that came about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was, you know, just say, you know, what about an idea of a brain? You know, I, I know we think it was just hemispheres. <laughs> I know that had been planted in his mind. He said, what about a brain with an umbrella over it? And, okay, the idea was how to do this without making it look ridiculous. Right. You know, <laughs> you know it would look like a cartoon and ruin the image. And I think there's two more. Yeah, yeah this is, yeah, there's, uh, there's that, of course, you know, pretty classics. Yeah. And... And there's that image of one of the roads. Nice. Um, so I really got to, I was excited because I really got to do this and the thing, uh, and the, uh, you know, explore it. And uh, I, I sold, offshoots of this is, I have a portfolio that I do sell mm -hmm. of all the images that come in like in a leather case, signed and everything. And it's hand signed, the main piece. So mm -hmm. you get a, a, a leather portfolio and it's got, prints of each one of the images but the main image of the cover is well it, it, they're numbered yeah. but it's hand signed by me ray and and jim oh wow yeah wow. so that so that's for real hardcore fanatic i'm tempting, <laughs> I'm tempting you like the devil now right yeah, yes, you are. <laughs> with that record you are <laughs> yeah. so it's one time it's one and, time. and it was a really great experience and that kind of set up for me doing a couple of more that I did for them later. I did FWX, you know, mm. 2010 and so on. Yeah. Um, it's weird how me and him work. It's just whatever the mood hits us, like one of a sudden, he'll just call, you know, just say, you, you're up to something. So there's no set. Mm. Jim is a pure artist. So yes. he works like that. Yeah. It's whatever mood he's in at the moment. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. There's nothing pre-planned. 
and, and kind of taking another turn now into the classic rock world. Um, another big one you did was Blue Oyster Cult. And what it was their last record for about 20 years up until they just released a new one. It was called Curse of the Hidden Mirror. Yep. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, the other key thing too is a sad moment. It was the last time it was the three real members, which is Eric Blue, Lanier, yeah. and Darlene, and we lost Lanier. So, yes. so it's really down to the two of them. Um, yeah, they hadn't recorded an album in a while. I, I, I was, it was, it, the commission came through the record label. I went to see them, I, I meet with them, speak to them. Um, Lanier had taken sort of the, uh, the, the reins on this one. And he was talking to me and initially, he was fascinated with cats. Um, and he said, you know, something about, I'm thinking of something about cats, you know, you know, hidden mirror. You know, and, I, and I said, you know, uh, I said, my, I said, you know, um, you know, he said something about Egyptian mysticism. I kind of like that. You know, he said to me, can we do something along those lines? And I said, um, he says, you know, like, you know, like those, those films you would see in the 1930s, the 1940s, you know, like serials, you know, like it was always these, you know, Captain Video or whatever, or it was, you know, so-and-so saving the Egyptian princess from whatever. And I said, and I said, okay, let's take the Egyptian theme out of it, but I like your idea, the curse of the hidden mirror, is about one of those weird serials from the 1930s, kind of, you know, the, mm -hmm. those movie little things that were run on Saturday mm -hmm. where you always have to come to the cliffhanger and you have to go the following <laughs> Saturday to the movies to see it. And that's how the idea started to merge. And I was starting to dabble now in digital art, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I had gotten, you know, quite a bit better at it. So I presented them with, the cover and it was that was basically that it was this mm. insane looking uh concept mm. uh you know curse of the hidden mirror and uh some of those images came from that postcard set also really uh yeah. that's what that was yeah. and i think you can see there's more stuff in there but the single kind of followed up the story Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what it was. So it's you it, blue oyster call you hear curse of the hidden mirror, and you look at this, and it's like, okay, what's going on there? Something very you know, <laughs> strange is happening, you know. And it's extremely surreal, very Pink Floydish, I guess. Yeah. Maybe it's got that sense of twist to it, but it completely appealed to their their idea because mm -hmm. there's like something cosmic and beyond going on. Mm. And then you get the guy holding the, the blue oyster cold symbol yeah. you know, with the glass reflecting it. It's like he's trying to communicate something. <laughs> and the, the, the whole look is very 1930s, you know, the yeah. way they're dressed and everything. So it, it's just like, you feel like you walked in the middle of some kind of a bizarre film. And, you know, <laughs> somebody's got to fill you in what the hell is going on. Yeah, there's a story uh, to it. Yeah, yeah, it went down a storm. The minute he looked at it, they're like, oh, yeah. this is the bomb. You know, we want this. Yeah. Um, and that's how uh, yeah. that project thing. And I did that and then did the live album afterwards. And yeah. then, you know, they, uh, they just went on a, on a forever tour after that. You yeah. know, just and and our, our last one for today kind of takes yeah. us into the world of 80s rock band and that other band from Boston, uh, actually 1990 release from Extreme and they're just monster record porno graffiti. Take uh, it away. I had finished in the outroom for a band called Bang Tango. Uh, Which I love. And, right. Uh, <laughs> and they were doing it really, really well. They had seen that artwork. They liked it. Uh, what was going on because, you know, they were already playing the scene and mm -hmm. they were like the opening act and, you know, I think Bank Tech had gone gold or something. That record that I did uh, was at Psycho Cafe, I think. Yes. And it was, it was that movement in the late 80s. Them, mm -hmm. the cult, they all had that, that style. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went up to see them 
uh, up in Boston. I was introduced to them and they, we got together and we talked about it. The only thing they had going at the time was they had a logo that Gary had drawn, mm -hmm. Sharon, which I thought was, was cool. But they hadn't even settled on their look yet. You know, I mean, thinking right. you know, a bandana around his head or something. I can't <laughs> remember, you know, they hadn't honed down their look. They were huge Queen fans. Mm. And by that time, one of my best friends who still is, which we do a lot of work with, is Mick Rock. And mm. Mick is the guy who had done the Queen two covers. Mm. So the first thing I told Extreme was, I'm going to get Mick Rock to do the photo shoot. So right there, they were ecstatic over that idea. Mm. Because just the idea that they're going to get the guy who did their idols, mm. you know, to photograph them was great. So, um, you know, they told me about the album. I heard the songs. I thought it was great. I have very fun memories of this. Hmm. Um, and it's also a special record to me because that got me my first platinum record. Really? In right there on the wall. Up there. <laughs> the Johannes for a million, for a million. So my first platinum plaque that I have up hmm. on my wall. Um, so uh, my sister was also working with me at the time. Now she's younger than me and, and hmm. she had graduated to be a co-art director with me. So... I remember going up to Gary's mom's house and we're sitting in, you know, in the, we went into the kitchen and his mom made us spaghetti. <laughs> just really freaking cool. You know, we got there up north of Boston. Mm. Uh, it was about six, seven o'clock. And so it's me and Liz, my sister, and Gary and Nuno come, came up from downstairs. She was jamming his guitar. They'd be mm. rehearsing in the cellar of Gary's house. Mm. And uh, it was just a really, you know, old style Italian neighborhood, yeah. you know, real blue collar, you know, you know, the neighbors are complaining there's too much noise coming from the basement, <laughs> you know, the kids yeah. are making too much noise. And we're sitting and we're eating spaghetti and my sister found this postcard of this, this kid had a haircut. It was like 1920 or something. And, and Gary looks at that and says, that's going to be Francis, <laughs> you know, in that they named the kid. Yeah. And uh, I said, oh, all right. So we drew him and that was him right here. <laughs> and it was, it was like, what should pornography be? It'll be, well, it'll be this kid. And it'll be this kid. He said that, you know, just is pissed off at the world. He just walks around, you know, doing graffiti. So we're like, great. So, um, I, he says, how are we going to do this? And I said, well, we're going to draw him. And then, you know, I want to do a combination. I think that movie had come out, Roger Rabbit, I think, yeah. which were, it was, you know, actual real backgrounds, but with the animation. Yeah. And you didn't have Macintosh yeah. yet. You didn't have personal computers. You had digital places. Mm. It cost a fortune to do that. So we did the artwork with mm -hmm. watercolor. And then I com got photographs of areas of uh, San Francisco, mm -hmm. you know, the d red light district. Yeah. And everything was composed um, digitally to create the original artwork and something that you could do right now, what I just did there, you could do in Photoshop in about three minutes. Right. <laughs> it took us days it was five hundred dollars an hour and it, you know you'd be sitting there it's like watching paint dry mm. you know the digital art that yeah. that, that pixel by pixel coming yeah, line right. by line yeah, yeah yeah coming in and you have to, yeah. okay can we move this to the left oh jesus this is like another two yeah. hours <laughs> you know, you know. Mm. And we, I, I think we blew the whole budget on that front mm. cover um <laughs> The funny thing I remember was just made so many things went wrong. I, I flew, they were in California finding, mm. finishing the mix. And we went to, a, so we had to go to A&M Records to the studios to explain everything and show the artwork. Well, they liked the artwork, but to explain everything to the creative director, to the vice president of A&M Records and all this, because mm. this was a big deal. And I, I had to take Mick Rock with me because he was going to do the photo shoot he was going to do in California. Mm -hmm. and Mick Rock hates to fly. He, he just, he's, he, he, it, it, it's an incredible fear of him. Of course, so I had to go pick up Mick. He had to stay over at my house. And then I had to drive him to the airport and fly with him. And of course, we get on the plane and we take off JFK and there's a lightning storm. And the <laughs> Mick would have taken off 
lightning hits the plane, right? The back of the plane. And I can see Mick about to go completely bananas. <laughs> right? I mean, he just lost it. So anyways, we get to California. We're going up and I, I'm thinking, how hard could it be? I said to Mick, yes, what we're going to do? We're going to, um, you know, after they finish recording, there's a ton of places in, in, mm -hmm. in, in Los Angeles. And, you know, we're just going to go to the red light district. They have them posing in front of one of some of those X-rated, you know, yeah. whatever, theaters, whatnot. They'll play and we just shoot them, you know. No big deal, because you could do that in New York. Nobody cares. Right. Not in California. You need a license for everything you do in Los Angeles. So <laughs> I'm sitting there, and I'm telling you this, and, and the guy goes to me, the creative director of the record label, oh, so were you guys doing the photo shoot? I said, yeah, we're doing uh, in the hotel. We have it booked uh, in, in one of the ballrooms. We're going to do the set, make mm -hmm. sense of the background. We'll shoot that. And then we're going to do some live stuff. He goes, oh, wait, how are you going to do it? And I explain, he goes, oh, that's a cool idea. That's going to look great, great. And, and, and did you go and you get the license and you got the insurance and everything? I'm like, what license? What insurance? <laughs> he says, the minute you start shooting, the cops are going to surround you guys. Yeah. You're going to get arrested. You know, you know, you're not supposed yeah. to, you know, in, in Los Angeles, anywhere to do anything because of all the movie projects yeah. and that. There's a fee to, to set up to do anything commercially. I'm like, Oh no, right? <laughs> Too late now. So we did, we got a van and we would pile everybody in the van. We pull up in front of, it looked like a bank robbery. We would pull up in front of an X, you know, one of those x rated theaters or whatever, mm -hmm. open the door, you scream, everybody run out. You know, they run out, make her run out, three snapshots, everybody run back <laughs> in the back van the and take <laughs> off before anybody noticed what was going on. It would teach, we look like, I mean, we look like crazy people with the band. <laughs> you know, in there, you know, they're all getting rocked over. You know, this and that. And he's like, this is the most insane thing I've ever done. But it, they loved it. They yeah. went nuts over it. And and the album, of course, exploded when it yes, came Yes, it did. I mean, made them household names. Everything became into, in, fell into place. Of course, I know. Of all the songs, the most unlikely song became the biggest hit, yeah. which was the acoustic number that they did. Yeah, more than words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, a funny yeah. Story. There is an afterthought to that is, sure. uh, I don't know how many people know this, but, but a year later, um, the next, the, what we did is, you know, Freddie Mercury passed away mm -hmm. and they did a concert, you know, they were in the, you know, the tribute for Freddie yeah. Mercury that was, and they performed. And that was the closest I got to Queen at the time was uh, mm -hmm. Extreme released a single limited edition vinyl single of them doing the song love of my life mm. and it's them but the guitar work the lead guitar player is brian may yeah. on that right and uh that was me and mick who um of course they came to us to do the artwork and this is you know this is the actual single i found that oh that's fantastic I have it and yeah there's the back, and I mean, they were in love with it. I remember Jim Beach uh, just thought it was the best. Wow. And uh, this picture, I think it's Mick's niece, uh, little niece. This is from 19, from the same time, 72, 73, yeah. with Jacqueline. So this just made just perfect sense. You know? That's incredible. Our work. Um, yeah. From my prized possessions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would imagine. Yeah, man. Well, yes, thank you so much. Um, and, and for people watching this at the bottom of the screen, when this posts on the site, we'll have a link to your website. A lot thank of you. your art is available for people to purchase in various forms. So everyone could check that out. And we will have you back on again shortly. And we'll dig a little deeper into some of these genres and some of these bands and hear some of your stories inside the covers. So Thank you so much for doing this. I'm honored uh, to be part of the show. Love it. Uh, there's some cool stuff, you know. Thank you so much, my friend. We'll be talking soon. We're really great. Thank you so much, man. Take Thanks. care of yourself.